We've convened this morning to review the President's proposed budget for the Department of Interior and uh, Secretary Holland. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you back uh, for your first budget hearing before the Committee of Secretary of Interior. Uh, the Interior Department has dual and sometimes conflicting responsibilities. On one hand, the Department is responsible for managing and protecting our national parks, wildlife refuges, the public lands, and providing for outdoor recreation, which has become increasingly important. At the same time, the Department is responsible for managing public lands and offshore resources to responsibly develop the energy and mineral resources that we need to maintain our energy independence. It's with that dual mission in mind that we should be reviewing priorities contained in this budget request. At a high level, the President has requested $17.6 billion in appropriations for the Interior Department in fiscal year 2022. That represents an increase of $2.5 billion, or 17% over the current enacted level, and a sharp contrast to the 16% cut proposed last year by the previous administration. The budget includes new mandatory funding provided by the Great American Outdoors Act, which has signed into law last year. That law is providing the department with much needed funding over five years to address high priority deferred maintenance project, as well as permanent funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund at its fully authorized level. The Great American Outdoors Act was enacted with broad bipartisan support, and I think it is important that the funding process be equitable and transparent. I appreciate that the administration has provided Congress with lists of its proposed maintenance and LWCF and deferred maintenance projects. I hope that we can use this hearing to get better understanding of how the department is prioritizing funding. I expect that there will be much discussion this morning on the department's policies and proposals concerning energy development on federal lands and waters. In January, President Biden issued an executive order pausing new oil and gas lease sales on federal lands and waters to allow time for a comprehensive review of the program. While I've supported the administration's desire to pause lease sales to make sure the American people are getting fair returns for our shared resources, we are now well into the early summer timeline when we were told the review would be completed. I also understand that a federal judge has issued an injunction against the administration's pause, although I expect that decision will be appealed. In any event, we need a plan to move forward with responsible oil and gas leasing, both onshore and offshore, to maintain our energy independence. I look forward to discussing this in further detail with Secretary Holland later this, uh, in this hearing. I'll turn now to a cons cons constituency that is near and dear to my home state. Coal miners have made tremendous sacrifices and have done the heavy lifting that powered our nation to greatness. The country has benefited from the work that the scars of abandoned mine lands left in those communities, and it is imperative that we give back to coal communities for the sacrifices they made for our nation. So I was pleased to see the President's budget called for a $50 million increase for the Mandan Mine Land Economic Revitalization, or AMLER, grant program, which helps to eliminate health and safety hazards and reclaim areas for future economic benefit in places like West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky, which was the heart of the coal country. I look forward to continuing to work with you to ensure all outstanding mine land reclamation needs, including post-1977 areas, governed under Title V of the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act, which we refer to as SMACRA, are adequately addressed. Finally, I'd like to make a note about departmental nominations. I'm pleased that the Senate confirmed Tommy Boudreaux as your deputy earlier this summer, but I'm disappointed that we have yet to receive a nomination for director of the National Park Service. The national parks, <coughs> including the newest national park, the New River Gorge, our nation's newest, as are seeing record visitations this summer as the nation reopens. And the National Park Service has significant funding decisions to make in implementing the Great American Outdoors Act. Yet the Park Service has been without a confirmed director since the end of the Obama administration. I urge the President to send us a nomination so that we can get this position filled as quickly as possible. Now I'll turn to my friend, Senator John Barrasso, for his opening statement. Well, thanks so very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I start uh, my statement, I'd like to extend an invitation to Secretary Holland. Madam Secretary, uh, this past weekend, uh, Governor Gordon and I were in Wyoming and we were discussing the tragedy of missing and murdered indigenous people. Uh, as you know, it is a serious issue facing members of the Northern Arapaho and the Eastern Shoshone tribes on, the, uh, on and outside the Wind River Reservation 
and uh, it's something we're dealing with in Wyoming. And I know you are deeply uh, concerned and care about this issue, and I just would like to invite you to come to Wyoming with the governor, with me, uh, to get your valuable insights. Th 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 thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, because I think it's very, very timely that Secretary Holland is here today to testify on the President's fiscal year 2022 Department of the Interior budget. So, so welcome. The West is facing many challenges. Wildfires and drought are threatening our communities. Rural communities, ranching and farming families face a real water crisis this year. Uh, the West is where most of our federal lands are located, yet so many of the policies of the administration seem to be distinctly anti-Western. Last month, a federal court issued a nationwide injunction on President Biden's so-called pause on oil and gas lease sales. Under the court order, the department is required to hold new oil and gas lease sales. To date, it has not noticed any new oil and gas lease sales. It's past time for the administration to comply with the law and hold new lease sales. Energy production on public lands is the engine of Wyoming's economy. It creates good paying jobs. It provides tremendous revenue for the state, for our schools, and for critical services. The Biden administration seems intent on destroying the livelihoods of oil, natural gas, and coal workers in the West. It's tearing away all the advantages that traditional energy production brings our states, our local communities, and our families. The department needs to change course and get back to an American energy dominance agenda, an agenda that creates jobs and provides for energy independence from foreign adversaries. Much of the West is also facing historic drought. Droughts contributing to a number of issues, including wildfires. According to the National Interagency Fire Center, wildfires in the West have already consumed around 2 million acres, and we are early in the fire season. In addition to drought and extreme temperatures, the lack of proactive forest management has created the perfect storm for catastrophic wildfire events. These fires threaten the safety of our local communities and the, th the safety of our wildland firefighters. We can and should do more to make our public lands less susceptible to such devastation. This can be done in part through thinning forested lands. Drought also highlights how critical water is to all aspects of Western communities. We've not been building significant or sufficient water storage for Western communities for years. As the West grows, so does our demand for water. Yet our water supplies are dwindling. In Wyoming and many parts of the West, that means less water for ranchers and farmers. For communities in the West, the negative economic impact is significant. The administration has not prioritized water development in the West. The Bureau of Reclamation is the only Interior Department agency within this committee's purview that actually received a cut in the administration's budget. The department could help our Western ranchers who graze cattle on federal lands by making temporary pasture available and assisting with water storage development. The Bureau of Reclamation programs to build more water storage are expiring this year. I've introduced uh, legislation, the Western Water Infrastructure Act, to extend these programs. Existing Bureau of Reclamation water storage infrastructure is also crumbling. The Bureau needs to fund the repairs and to modernize these facilities. My legislation addresses these critical issues. The Biden administration can and should do more to make American energy independent and maintain and create more jobs in the West. Much more needs to be done to make our public lands more resilient to the threat of wildfires. The Bureau of Reclamation also needs to be a higher priority for this administration if we are to maintain and grow a viable rural Western economy. So I look forward to exploring these and other issues with the Secretary today. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, I, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. I'd like to say also uh, just a moment of silence for our, our friend who passed away unexpectedly is Mike Enzi. Thank you all. And well, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the, the nice sentiments for Senator Renzi, who is a friend, colleague to so many of us. The, uh, and uh, I'm going to be going to the floor. If I leave the committee hearing, it's to go to the floor to address at length, with, along with Senator Lummis, our uh, love appreciation of the entire Renzi family and, and talk about Mike's service at the state and local community and in here in the Senate. Thank you, Mr. Such Chairman. A sad, such a sad, sad situation. 
Secretary Holland is accompanied by Rachel Taylor, a former West Virginian, uh, the Principal Deputy Assistant for Policy, Management, and Budget at the Department, and previously a longtime staff member on the Senate Interior Appropriations Committee. So we welcome both of you very kindly to come back and visit with us. So Secretary Holland, if you can proceed with your statement now. I couldn't tell it was on. Um, Chairman first and ranking member and members of the committee first, let me offer my condolences for your loss. I'm very sorry. I read the article this morning and, um, and I, I'm just so sorry for your loss. Um, Chairman, ranking member Brasso, members of the committee, it's an honor to be here with you today on behalf of the Department of the Interior. It's deeply meaningful to me as the first Native American cabinet secretary to be here on the ancestral homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway people speaking before you. This committee plays an important role in the success of the Department of the Interior and our many programs. The work that Congress has done on a bipartisan basis to support priorities such as the Great American Outdoors Act, wildland fire, tribal programs, has been integral to the ability of the Interior to meet our mission and it has had profound impacts on the lives of Native Americans and Alaska Natives in communities across our country. And in that spirit, I come before you today to present the fiscal year 2022 budget and to talk about how we can work together to ensure the department is ready and to meet this moment. The 2022 budget reflects the important role Interior will play to accomplish the administration's goals to move our country forward during this unprecedented time. The President's budget responds by proposing $17.6 billion in discretionary investments in Interior, as well as legislative proposals to implement the American Jobs Plan. <coughs> the programs you see reflected in the budget request lift up the President's goals of addressing the climate crisis, providing much needed resources to tribal nations, restoring balance on public lands and waters, advancing equity and environmental justice, investing in a clean energy future, and creating good paying jobs. I will walk through a few high level details now, and then I look forward to discussing the details with you. First, the budget supports <coughs> partnership programs that will advance the America the Beautiful initiative, our administration's effort to conserve 30% of US lands and waters by 2030 through locally led and voluntary projects. The request also allocates the full mandatory funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, a program I care deeply about as a member of Congress and am thrilled to help direct as secretary, and it includes $86 million for the Civilian Climate Corps Initiative. All told, the budget includes unprecedented investments to address the climate crisis, including more than $1.9 billion in new funding toward conservation, clean energy, climate science, and fleet modernization. This includes an increase of $133 million to accelerate and expand activities that support clean energy deployment across federal lands and waters. It includes more than $300 million to support fuels management activities to reduce the risk of wildland fire, funds to help prevent wildfires from taking hold, growing in severity, and threatening communities and resources. The budget request prioritizes investments in science, including $200 million in new funds that will help to understand climate impacts and make better decisions about how to mitigate, adapt, and increase resilience across the landscape and in our communities. It also provides $300 million to support the President's Reclamations Jobs Initiative and clean up legacy pollution by plugging orphan oil and gas wells, and cleaning up abandoned mines. And it includes major investments for Indian country. The budget includes $4.2 billion across all Indian Affairs programs, which is $728 million above fiscal year 2021 levels. This includes a focus on strengthening tribal sovereignty, including a proposal for $150 million to reestablish the land con consolidation program with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. This request also includes important increases for tribal public safety and justice programs, including $16.5 million for program, 
programs like Interior's Missing and Murdered Unit that address the missing and murdered indigenous peoples crisis. And finally, to ensure our nation's legal obligations to tribes are fully met, the budget proposes to shift funding for tribal water settlements, contract support costs, and tribal lease payments to mandatory spending starting in fiscal year 2023. These are just some of the highlights of this budget request. I look forward to working with the committee to achieve these important goals. I commit to you that I will continue to honor and respect the role of this committee with the confident expectation that working together, we can accomplish great things on behalf of the American people. This concludes my remarks, and I look forward to um, answering your questions. Thank you, Secretary Hall, and I'll begin with the questions. Uh, I've, I've said that the administration has the right and, and basically the responsibility uh, to look at all the leases that we have, and, and we've paused those. So I would ask, can you shed some light on the status of the review since after the pause and reviewing what you may have found and what's the next steps we'll take? Chairman, thank you so much for that question. And uh, first, I will uh, just assure you that we are complying with the court order. We're evaluating our options, including what has been previously available for leasing. Of course, it's, it's, there's a lot of work that goes into uh, moving that forward. Um, we are working, uh, the review is being finalized internally, and um, we hope to get it out very soon. If you can just give us a little bit of the progress or whoever we can contact in your office that could give us the progress of how that is coming, what direction you might be going, might give us a little better light on that, okay? Uh, y yes, Chairman. We will absolutely, I can have my staff reach out to Please. your staff and we'd be happy to do that. Be happy. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Also, uh, on the uh, American supply chains, the, you know, the uh, President's order on American supplies chain, which is a critical minerals we need for so many things and products we use every day. Um, there's nothing in there for basically, I think, for what you all put a report back out of how you're going to determine where those minerals might be located and how we might be best to extract those for the use of American in, in our American supply chain. So if, if you could tell me how you're uh, focused on the clean energy supply chain uh, when the budget doesn't really uh, show that whatsoever. Thank, thank you, Chairman. I, um, of course, we understand that this is important. The President um, believes very strongly and supports energy independence and those critical mineral, minerals, of course, are, are part of uh, our clean energy future. Um, the uh, USGS uh, is studying these issues. Uh, we want to make sure that whatever we do, of course, is done responsibly. Uh, we'd be more than happy to follow up as well with your office on any details that you might uh, request. Well, what we put $50 million in that, as you recall, okay? Yes. And basically, we looked at how you all were dispersing and what you were using it for. And it, uh, it, the budget request, it, it included many priorities, include $5 million for forecasting, but doesn't have anything, not anything in there for the critical mineral resource assessment, what we have in our country, what we can expect to do, and how we can support all the, all the industry and all the need to products we need in America. Uh, the shortest way to, to, uh, to uh, avoid wasteful damaging vetting and flaring so this is venting and flaring on public lands. On private lands, most of the methane is taken off because it has value to it. Mm -hmm. But on the public lands, we found out the impediment of not taking and why they're continuing to flare, which we think is harmful, dangerous, and wasteful, is because they can't get permits for pipelines that take that product to market. So if you could explain to me, uh, are there any steps that you all have taken to reduce the flaring and venting of this product and allowing that uh, be, to be taken to market, or how are you all looking at that? Uh, Chairman, thank you so much for the question, and I uh, appreciate your um, commitment to this issue. Um, the administration is focused on reducing methane emissions, and uh, I think you know that the Obama administration issued a rule to limit flaring, but that's been involved in litigation. Um, so we know that that's part of protecting uh, taxpayers. And so we, and the environment, of course, um, we'd be happy to, uh, to fill you in with further details, but it is definitely a priority. We'd about. be happy to sit down with you because we can only tell you what we know is that basically they cannot get a permit 
to take to build a pipeline to take the methane off. We have the technology. We do it in the private sector. We do it all over the East Coast because it is a valued product. But out west, they're not doing it, and then we are getting condemned for flaring, which is very lethal to the environment. And on the other hand, we can get it to, pro to market. So we're going to have to either adapt a policy that we can get that product to market, or you'll never do any more leasing if flaring is going to be the criteria. That's my only comment on that. Um, fewer than two weeks ago, the committee reported out a bipartisan infrastructure bill in which we authorized $19 billion to reclaim my abandoned mine lands and orphan gas wells. Also, Senator Heinrich brought to, to our attention that, that the, the horrible condition of hard rock mining. We know that. And we're looking desperately to find that money to do that, too. But we've got to re repurpose everything, and we will at the proper time, but that's something to be done. How are you all approaching that as far as the um, benefits of having the program department level as opposed to just passing funds directly to agencies? Because Th right. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I love for Rachel to um, to have an opportunity to fill you sure. in on some details. I can tell you that this is an important issue for us, and in fact, I traveled recently to Pennsylvania to witness um, how well they're doing with reclaiming these uh, these abandoned mine lands. It's it works, and um, and Rachel, thank you. I'm not sure. Does the mic work? Can you hear me? Okay. You're here. Yeah, you're okay. good. It's. it's um, so, as you know, I mean, the, we're grateful for your leadership in working on the, the infrastructure package, which includes the president's commitment on these issues. Um, we also have some important investments in the budget itself, which uh, the budget request itself, which spoke to the, um, the reclamation jobs and the proposals that, that you're mentioning. And that includes the AMLER program you mentioned, but it also includes some of the hard rock cleanup issues. And I think, you know, one of the issues that we're focusing on is, is inventorying and getting really good data across the country. And that's going to be on federal lands, that's going to be on tribal lands, and that's going to be on non-federal lands as well. Um, so we we've definitely have investments that are tailored towards that. And um, what we what we had envisioned is that we would have a centralized program that would help sort of roll up all the priorities across land management agencies so we, would, we could look at the highest priorities on the federal family side. Um, and then we would provide assistance to states and tribes so that they could deal with the, the hard rock mining cleanup as well. So we, we are continuing to engage on this issue and appreciate the priority that, that you mentioned. Along the mining issue, I'll just, my, my time has expired, but on the, on the mining issue, I'll tell you that there's a bigger problem basically with the bonding companies post smacker That's <laughs> post-1977. We've been talking a lot. Of, we put $11 billion towards pre-1977, pre-SMACRA. Post-SMACRA, bonding companies are walking away from this. Companies are declaring bankruptcy. Bonding companies are thinking they're off the hook once the company declares bankruptcy, and nothing gets done. It's ridiculous what's going on, so I hope you look into that. We're going to be doing a deep dive into that also, along with hard rock mining to make sure they're, they're going to be operating on the same procedures. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Senator Brasso. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Secretary. I have just a couple. I have some short questions. Just if you could respond briefly, and, and the first has to do with with tree spiking, where people drive metal spikes into trees. And and do you know if can tree spiking kill or maim loggers or mill workers? Well, I know that Senator, I, I imagine so. I, I I have I was not really familiar with any of that practice until recently. Um, and you know, is tree spiking uh, in national forests a federal crime? Uh, Senator, I couldn't tell you for sure, but um, but I, I imagine it, it's it, it is it's yeah. very dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So, should individuals who are aware of spiked trees in, in terms of national forests should they immediately inform law enforcement? I I imagine that um, anyone should inform law enforcement if it's a danger, sure. Yeah. So uh, I guess the question is, you know, should individuals who plan or otherwise are involved in tree spiking incidents and threaten physical safety of federal officials, should they expect to be hired by the Department of Interior? Um, Senator, I, if, if I may, I, um, I, I believe you're referring to the nominee, uh, Tracy Stone Manning. And um, I also recognize that um, she was nominated by President Biden because he felt she could do the job and that she was qualified otherwise. And the issue of wildfires in the West, which is a major issue as wildfires are burning around the West, uh, 
national forests burn. There's an interface now with areas where uh, people build homes and forests can burn, and there's, there are problems for sometimes structures who are at risk who are at this interface where structures are built. So do you agree the, with this statement? Perhaps the solution to houses in the interface uh, is to let them burn. Well, I, I, I can't necessarily agree or disagree, uh, but I, I, I mean, I think the wildfires are just getting more intense because of climate change, and that's why we need to make preventative measures and, and put resources toward um, protecting communities. So do you, do you agree with this statement? There is a, a, a rude and satisfying justice in burning down the house of someone who builds in the forest? I don't know. Okay. Uh, do you agree that children are an environmental hazard? Do I agree that children, children are, are an, an environmental, environmental hazard? hazard? Yeah. No. no? Okay. Do you agree that grazing on federal lands is destroying the West? These are obviously statements that someone else has made that you know, uh, we disagree with, and I want to see if you're of that uh, same mindset. Uh, um, I haven't heard all these statements, Senator. I mean, I agree there are a lot of things that are destroying the West, like drought and wildfire and, mm -hmm. and climate change. Uh, of course, climate change is certainly uh, ruining a lot of our country yeah. right now. Yeah. But you, you wouldn't necessarily want to hire an employee in a land management position who agrees or puts forth these statements about satisfying justice and letting houses burn or children as environmental hazards? Um, Senator, what, what I will say is that um, I, as the Secretary of the Interior, uh, uh, am not um, personally um, hiring anyone. I believe that is a team effort, and I know that uh, the Senate plays a very large role in any of these positions as well. So on June 15th, a federal court issued a nationwide injunction against President Biden's ban on oil and gas lease sales on federal land and waters. Shortly afterwards, a spokesman uh, for your department said the department would comply with the court's order. However, to date, and here we are, it's now July 27th, six weeks later, the department has failed to notice any oil and gas lease sales. Will the department hold onshore oil and lease sales this quarter, that's before the end of September. Um, <clears throat> Senator, the uh, department is complying with the court order. Uh, it's, as, as you may know, it's not a switch you can turn on. Uh, there is a lot of work that goes into um, a lease sale. And so we're complying with the court's order. We're, we're evaluating our options. And that includes what's previously uh, been available for leasing. So, so will the department then reschedule that first and second quarter of the year lease sales that had previously been postponed? Um, Senator, in addition to the fact that we are complying with the court order, I'll just say that this matter is in litigation and I can't necessarily go into any more details about it. Okay. And then finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, the West is currently suffering historic drought conditions, as you and others on the committee have said. Yet the, the budget that the president proposed seeks to cut funding for the Bureau of Reclamation, as I mentioned in my opening statement, while increasing funding for the other components of the Department of, of Interior. Would you agree with me that now, during historic drought conditions, it's, it is time to prioritize Western water infrastructure, not cut infrastructure uh, from it? Well, certainly water is, is absolutely important, and uh, we have team members who work on this issue every single day, and it's a priority to them, and, um, and they're in very close contact with folks on the ground in those areas. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Brasso. And Senator Heinrich, please. Uh, Madam Secretary, I want to start by just thanking you for your historical leadership in Congress and otherwise on protecting the greater Chaco Canyon uh, area. I want to ask you what plans does the Department of Interior have to protect this priceless cultural landscape and are you considering an administrative withdrawal? Thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, thank you for your letter. We appreciate um, your your commitment to um, this beautiful area of our country. Um, 
And of course, uh, we consider all proposals from members of Congress uh, very carefully. Uh, the administration has requested a continuation of the 10-mile buffer area around Chaco and its budget request for fiscal year 2022. Um, and we'll continue to engage with tribes, with Congress, and other stakeholders uh, with respect to any other future um, decisions. So the, the BLM is also still in the process of amending the resource management plan for the region around Chaco. Um, but pandemic restrictions and a, and, and a lack of broadband internet uh, access that you are more than familiar with uh, really meant that the public comment and tribal consultation processes for the draft plan were largely inaccessible back in um, 2020 to many of my constituents. How can you ensure that, that tribes have a meaningful opportunity to participate before that plan amendment is actually finalized? Um, thank you, Senator. And tribal consultation is a top priority for our department and for this administration. And in fact, our principal deputy assistant secretary for Indian Affairs, Brian Newland, will be in Chaco Canyon, uh, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, he intends to have meetings with tribes. He's meeting uh, the chairman of the All Pueblo Council of Governors there and having uh, meetings with, with other folks and stakeholders on the ground. So we will make sure that um, we use whatever method is best for that, um, for that action. Uh, because yes, the, we have to we have to meet them where I, they are. I, I appreciate your efforts there very much because those those efforts were not evident uh, with the previous secretary and and he and I discussed this at length and it seemed to make absolutely no difference. So uh, I appreciate uh, your effort and and those of Brian as well. Uh, one of the budget challenges at the Department of Interior has been the historic lack of investment in law enforcement. There are only about 15 law enforcement officers right now for New Mexico's millions of acres of Bureau of Land Management land. That often, that lack of funding often leads to looting of priceless cultural resources um, and, and a host of other problems. So I, are we spending enough on, on law enforcement? Senator, th thank you for the question. And um, I, I have... Um, first-hand experience with this issue, so I completely understand, and it's not, um, certainly not just in New Mexico, but I met with tribes when we were in Colorado, and they're experiencing the same issue, three officers for um, a large swath of Colorado. Um, I, I would um, maybe uh, ask Rachel if she can shed a little bit more light on, on the budget issue here. Uh, but want you to know that it's a priority for our department. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I mean, I, I think that that sets out the issue well. Obviously, our um, our law enforcement officers have an enormous amount of land to to patrol and um, and you know varied resource challenges uh, on the ground to, to address. Um, I will say that one of the primary investments that we're making in this budget are, speaks to the tribal resources for public safety, um, which has been really important. There's a 13% increase across the board in public safety programs within BIA, which is, is definitely you know, in need of, of additional resources. Um, and that's going to have funding that's going to um, implement increases across the board to tribes. It's going to have some targeted increases to, uh, to deal with the, the, the recent Supreme Court decision for the, from the McGirt case. Um, we have the, uh, the resources that the Secretary mentioned earlier, which is a $5 million increase for the missing and murdered endangered indigenous people. Uh, exercise and there's some additional resources for tribal courts as well. So um, it's definitely hope to Th thank assist. you. Thank you for those investments. I think they're incredibly important. Uh, Madam Secretary, is there a link between climate change um, caused by our over reliance on fossil energy sources and the wildfires that we're seeing in the West? There's, uh, I'm not a scientist, Senator, but it certainly does appear that climate change has everything to do with the wildfires that we're experiencing in their intensity. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Lee. 
All right. Uh, speaking of wildfires, uh, it's a grave concern to many of us in the West where there's a lot of federal land. Would you agree with me, Madam Secretary, that water storage is a critical feature for, uh, uh, of effective fire suppression? Senator, uh, we believe that there are a lot of tools in the toolbox to fight these wildland fires, and we want to make sure that we can use every single one of them. Including that one. Um, stakeholders in my state have indicated to me that, that the Department of the Interior's NEPA review of water storage infrastructure projects um, often presents an obstacle, that NEPA is often uh, delaying these projects and providing a significant impediment to getting them done. That, in turn, makes us more vulnerable to wildfires. I think there are some models that we could follow here and build off of. The Federal Highway Administration, for example, allows states to assume NEPA review responsibilities in order to facilitate more expeditious review. I, I believe there are at least seven states that do this, including California, Arizona, Utah, Alaska, Texas, Ohio, and Florida. So I understand these agreements. They, they, they work well. Uh, do you believe that states and the Department of Interior could both benefit from a similar arrangement uh, when it comes to water infrastructure? Senator, we're certainly happy to look at any ideas that you have, and uh, we'd be willing to be in touch with your office and, and explore that further. I appreciate that. I, I think there are some who are, uh, perhaps have a, a, reflect, a reflexive reluctance to make any changes to the way we do NEPA analysis. But it, it, it's important to remember here that um, states that currently participate in these programs, for example, with the Federal Highway Administration, participate in them in a way that still makes them accountable to the same standards. So just as NEPA analysis conducted by a federal agency can be stopped because it doesn't adhere to the standards of NEPA, so too a state-sponsored project uh, is held to the same standards accountable in the same courts. Now, it's been widely reported that your confidential report to President Biden on the Bears Ears National Monument and the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument recommended a full re-expansion. Now, if, if we're going to work together towards a legislative solution, it would be helpful to be able to understand the reasoning behind your recommendation. Can you tell me when that report will be released? Um, Senator, thank you so much. The report is now in the hands of the, uh, the president, and it would be up to the president as to when he uh, makes a decision and or releases the report. The Utah State Institutional Trust Lands Administration, uh, also known as CITLA, owns many thousands of acres within the boundaries of the original Bears Ears National Monument. So if the monument is re-expanded to encompass its original footprint, access to many of those parcels could be complicated or in some cases lost. Uh, can you tell me what your recommendation uh, might have been regarding those parcels? Um, Senator, as I mentioned, the report is in the hands of the president. Unfortunately, I am unable to, to share. That is actually with the president, and he will, um, it, it will be hit at his discretion when the report is released and when he makes a decision. I, th I, I hope he'll take those concerns into account, uh, uh, given that they will uh, affect Utah's school children. Uh, Energy Fuels, uh, which is a critical minerals company that's based in southern Utah, has made a number of attempts to speak with officials at the Department of the Interior and at the White House regarding the pending designation. Now, Energy Fuels' work I will, by all accounts, be critical in the development of any sort of new energy technologies. And I, I suspect you would agree that uh, with, with so few of our critical minerals being produced domestically right now, it's critical that we work with stakeholders to ensure their success. Uh, can you please see to it that, um, that, that it's addressed and that they get substantive responses to their questions and concerns? Absolutely. A White House official recently stated that the nomination of Tracy Stone Manning to head the Bureau of Land Management was, quote, a massive vetting failure. Do you agree with that characterization? Um, Senator, I don't. Um, I know that uh, the president nominated her because he he believes she is uh, qualified, and and I believe she is too. Now, at the time she was nominated, were you aware that Ms. Stone Manning had previously told the newspaper that she quote could have been charged with conspiracy were it not for 
her agreement with the U.S. attorney, close quote? Uh, no, Senator. Okay. I see my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Now we have Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Madam Secretary. I'm glad to see that the USGS budget includes over 200 million in new climate change investments. This includes adding more than $42 million to the climate adaptation and science centers, with one of the regional centers being located in Hawaii. The budget also adds five million for reducing threats of invasive species and wildlife disease in a changing climate. Noting efforts will initially focus in Alaska, Hawaii, and the U.S. insular territories in the Pacific and the Northeast. And the budget also adds $5.4 million to the tools supporting conservation planning, monitoring, and projection budget to expand activities in Hawaii, Alaska, and the U.S. territories to map and model past, present, and future landscape conditions. As you know, invasive species and climate change are significantly impacting our ecosystems in Hawaii, whether furthering threats to our endangered species or increasing our wildfire risk. Additional support to strengthen efforts to mitigate these threats are sorely needed, and I look forward to working with you and my colleagues to make sure these programs receive strong funding. I also note that Hawaii has recently been invited to submit a full proposal for the Sentinel Landscape Partnership, a coalition between DOI, USDA, and DOD, as well as state and local governments and non-governmental organization that works with private landowners to advance sustainable land management practices across military installations and ranges. And we have some pretty large military installations in Hawaii. A uh, Sentinel landscape designation in Hawaii could bring additional federal resources to strengthen military readiness in the Indo-Pacific conservation, conserve natural resources, bolster, bolster agricultural and forest economics, mitigate wildfire, and increase climate change resilience. A Sentinel landscape designation in Hawaii is a very unique opportunity, and only seven landscapes in the nation have received such a designation. As DOI is part of the coalition, I would like to express my support for Hawaii's proposal and look forward to learning the review committee's final selection. So this is a public pitch for Hawaii's uh, submittal. Then I want to get to the National Park Service. The fiscal year National Park Service budget also makes some important investments in Hawaii. This includes over $6 million for land acquisition at Haleakala National Park and Pu'u Honoua or Honaunau National Park through the more fully funded land and natural con land and water conservation fund, thanks to the Great Outdoors, American Outdoors Act. It also includes funding for the advancing racial justice and equity for underserved communities initiative to help Hawaii parks better engage Native Hawaiian communities for, by providing for full-time community liaisons to support all Hawaii parks. The state activities include facilitating Native Hawaiian participation in park planning, program, programming operations, recruiting, and outreach. And as a, as a Native American yourself, I think you really understand the need to engage Native communities in what uh, the federal government is doing, what the National Park Service is doing. So um, I'm glad to see the Park Service making this effort to better engage the Native Hawaiian community and look forward to working with you and MPS on this. And then I actually am coming to a question. <laughs> um, increasing visitor diversity in public lands. And there's been uh, uh, assessments that, that our parks do not, uh, are not uh, accessed by minority groups, uh, other populations, and so I would think that the benefit uh, the department would benefit from data relating to the diversity of uh, visitors to our national parks 
And what, if any, obstacles does the department face in collecting such data and measure uh, visitation by racial and ethnic minorities to public lands? And how can the department and this committee work together to expand recreational opportunities on federal public lands to underrepresented populations? Thank you, Senator. That is absolutely an important question and something that we um, support wholeheartedly. Increasing the ability of underserved communities to use our public lands is, is, is absolutely a critical focus of this administration. Um, we will absolutely work with you and, and, and any senator on this committee to move the needle on that. Um, and, I, and if Rachel has anything to add, I would welcome her to add as well. Just, just to amplify that, um, as, as you probably know, the president uh, issued an executive order early on in the administration that challenged agencies to think about um, the equity issues within yes. the programs. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm proud to say that um, the access to underserved communities uh, to public lands is one of the, the issues that we've selected to do additional analysis on. And so we're in the process of doing that right now and looking at the barriers that we're, we're finding um, and looking at the data collection issues which you mentioned. Obviously, you want to... To succeed, you need to measure something. So, um, so we're we're committed to working with you, and would, would be happy to keep you abreast as the um, as the effort moves forward. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I I think we would all benefit from the uh, actual measures and uh, outreach efforts that uh, you are engaging in to uh, make sure that our parks fully serve uh, our diverse population in this country. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Senator. Chairman. Senator Langford. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Secretary, it's good to see you again. Thanks for being here. I need to walk through a couple of details in your budget. You have the um, information about the 30 by 30 or America the Beautiful Initiative, uh, setting aside 30% of the land in the United States okay. for conservation purposes. Can you give us some additional details briefly on that as well? Uh, what is that all going to be voluntary? It seems to be a voluntary set aside of that land. Uh, is that your expectation? Uh, yes, Senator. Uh, in large part, yes. A any additional lands, uh, we're inviting um, private landowners, organizations, tribal nations to participate in that. And um, and it, uh, we've met with a number of, actually, many stakeholders. What what percentage of America's land is already set aside that you would say is already in that initiative? Um, I understand that. Um, Give or take, please don't quote me on this, but I think the land is around 18% perhaps and the oceans maybe 12 or it might be. So trying to be able to move that from that 18% to 30%, do you expect this to be in every state or region or do you expect it to be nationwide? I guess what I'm saying is do you disproportionately expect the 30% of the land set aside to be in Alaska and Utah, let's say, and not as much as in New York State? Not at all. We, we expect and have had overwhelming um, optimism about the idea of it being a nationwide effort. So this would be in each region, each state, you would expect that. For states that have uh, higher than 30 percent already set aside, would you expect them to be able to get down to a 30 percent goal at some point so they'd have more private ownership in their area? On those specific details, Senator, I... I can't answer, but I, I get your point, and uh, the conversations will absolutely continue on this issue. So, the, uh, but you do expect it to be voluntary. Uh, that is correct for 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 yes for private landowners, for ranchers, for farmers, for right. Indian and I know tribes. I know in my state, and there's five states total that are in the area of what's called the Lesser Prairie Chicken uh, area. Uh, they've done voluntary efforts to do mitigation protection of that species for quite a while. Um, and now there's been a step in to say, actually, we're going to now impose different measures uh, in there. Where we've had, for instance, in my state, a great rebound in population. Uh, there seems to be an assumption now that's not enough. Uh, that in other areas, it's not recovering well. But in your area, where it is recovering well in my state, uh, we're, there's still going to be kind of a heavy hand to be able to reach in and to impose this. So what started as voluntary measures is now seems to be flipping over to mandatory measures for that. Uh, which is pretty disheartening, obviously, for folks that have done voluntary measures for a long time and have seen tremendous recovery of that species to try to work, <clears throat> excuse me, to get it off of the endangered species or threatened list. That's pretty disheartening to be able to see that. Uh, the landowners in my area, <clears throat> excuse me, are asking for an additional six months 
to say, allow us to comment, allow us to show the information. There's data that's coming out literally right now while Interior is making their decision on what to be able to do. Uh, there's an annual study that's coming out and that study is present. They need a little bit of time to be able to present it to everyone and say, don't take what's voluntary, suddenly turn it to mandatory before we can hand you this information. Is that a reasonable request, you think, for them to get a, a few more months in time to be able to hand over all their final information to you? I, I will certainly uh, take your request back and, and we will absolutely consider it. As I said, you know, we're open to ideas and your feedback. They're not trying to be unreasonable. They're just trying to say, hey, you're closing this down before I can actually hand you that this information. That is unreasonable to them. Uh, they're looking for a few more months of time to be able to hand over the final report so they can show you what's actually happening in the population count there. Uh, the leasing activities, we've talked a little bit about this already, about the leasing activity that stopped. Um, and then now a court has said you can't just keep this stopped indefinitely. You had mentioned earlier, hey, it takes a while to be able to restart it. When will that restart? Uh, Senator, we are, as I said, we are working on it right now. We're complying with the court's order right now. Will, will it take a year? Will it take three months? Will it take, give us a guess. I, I think I will say soon. So in this quarter? Soon. Uh, I don't. I can't answer that specifically, but as I said, we are working on it and uh, we're happy to stay in touch with you as we make the progress. So th there's just an expectation that when a court order stepped in and said, hey, this is not legal to just stop this indefinitely, that there's an actual gonna be progress made towards this. We know there's an interim report that's coming out. We don't know when that's coming. Do you have an update when the interim report is coming out? It, we, as I said, we're finalizing it internally at the moment, and uh, I can't say specifically, but I can say soon. It, it's in its final stages. And you'll expect a final report after that interim report? Um, Senator, I, we will be, we'll absolutely let you know when we approach that, um, that time frame, and uh, I can say soon. So there's a, a, an interim report that's soon, a final report that's soon. Do you expect the decision on lease sales after the final report or after the interim report or before? Well, after the report is, after the final report, the inner whatever report <laughs> is, is, is moved forward, uh, we will be able to make, we will have made decisions and be able to implement whatever changes are um, perhaps necessary and move that forward. Soon. Soon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Holland, thank you so much for being here. Let me say I appreciate uh, the comments so far, the increases to um, the uh, Department of Interior's budget, particularly your focus on our tribal communities, missing and murdered indigenous women and children. Thank you so much. There is an area I do want to focus on there where there is a decrease. And it's t been touched on a little bit here in the committee. And this has to do with the drought along the Colorado River. Uh, as you know, uh, the Colorado is the lifeblood blood for many Western states. It is the economic engine of the Southwest. And it supplies the drinking water to 36 million Americans. Uh, and, and that use of that water outstrips the supply. The seven basin states, water users, the federal agencies, and Mexico have a history of close cooperation, which has become ever more important as drought and increased water demands have left the two big reservoirs, that's Lake Powell and Lake Mead, at all-time lows. And as you well know, it is expected that a shortage will be declared uh, at Lake Mead next month, uh, and that predetermined water allocation reductions will go into effect next year. Here's what I'm concerned about as I look at the budget for the Bureau of Reclamation, it shows that for the fiscal year 2022 request, there is an 8% uh, decrease in, in the budget for the Bureau of Reclamation, and particularly when it comes to water and related resources, those water and energy management and development line item resources, there's a 7% decrease. So c can I ask you, how, how does the department of the interior um, ensure long-term reliability of the Colorado, particularly when we're focused on drought, 
Uh, we are seeing more wildfires in the West than we've ever seen before, and particularly in Nevada. Just in 2020 alone, there were 800 wildfires, and we need water uh, to fight these fires as well. Please talk to me how, how the department intends to help us address this drought issue when there is a decrease in, in the uh, budget for the Bureau of Reclamation. Thank you so much for the question, and you're absolutely right. It's incredibly important. I'm going to let Rachel answer that uh, so she can give specific details. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary, and thank you so much for the question. I, I think um, one point about the budget, just to, to, to set the stage, is you know, we, we view the budget as the whole budget, which includes the, the discretionary funding. It also includes the amounts that were provided through the President's uh, American Jobs Plan which the committee is now working to act upon. So I would say, you know, your, your concerns are well noted on the discretionary side. Um, you know, the committee has taken the, the president's jobs plan and expanded it much further to a larger uh, water infrastructure proposal, which, you know, obviously reflects the, the, the gravity of, of the need on the ground. I mean, certainly what's playing out in the Colorado River Basin, we're seeing it in basins across the West. Um, the secretary re referenced the, all of the tools in the toolbox approach, um, and so I think that is that is the ethos that we're bringing to the table is that we are willing to to look at the individual solutions everywhere. And I know that we want to work with this committee to to make sure that we are we're putting the resources on the ground where they're going to have the most impact. So just so I understand, you're hopeful that in the American Jobs Plan and legislation, we still have to pass that will address some of the concerns that I just talked about when it comes to drought and what we are hearing here about uh, preserving the water along the Colorado. Is that right? I, the, the President's proposal had strong investments, and I know Congress is, is looking to Let me it. talk about one of those, because I, I do want to bring it up. Um, we do need bold solutions, and that's why I introduced the Large-Scale Water Recycling Project and Drought Resiliency Investment Act. It establishes a competitive grant program within the Bureau of Reclamation for large-scale water recycling projects uh, that have a total estimated cost of at least $500 million. I talked about, um, and the bill authorizes $750 million for the program. This is necessary. These types of bold programs are necessary to bring new water into the system. And there is a partnership already between Nevada and Colorado just on one large-scale project alone. And so I am hopeful that the administration, the Department of Interior, you will support this type of legislation because this is the time for us to think bold and big, and this is the time for the federal government, the states, uh, Mexico, all of our partners along the Colorado to really start working together to address what we know and have concerns about, which is the drought that we see in the western states now. So I'm hopeful you'll be there to support this legislation and many other innovative ideas. Thank you very much, Senator. And, of course, always willing to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator High smith Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Holland, for appearing before the committee today to uh, talk about these important issues. And I'm really thankful that we were able to discuss some of these concerns about a month ago in the Appropriations Subcommittee hearing on Interior However, it is concerning to me that many of the questions and concerns my colleagues and I brought up in that hearing still lacks answers today, such as over the oil and gas leasing ban. And as you are well aware, a federal court judge ruled the pause on, a new, lease, on new leases unlawful. Yet there's been no response or action taken by your department to follow the law. I'm aware that the interim report, which is said to include initial findings on the status of the federal conventional energy programs, are outlined, and um, other recommendations for Congress is going to be released. But I just feel that this committee needs answers today, and uh, it certainly deserves transparency. So with that, I'm going to go with my questions. I'd like to discuss the report that your department is set to release. For clarification, is this report a final report or is it an interim report? Senator, thank you for the question. And uh, the report that we are set to release is, the, is an interim report and um, it will be released soon but it's totally an interim report. And does this report bring the department into compliance with current law? 
We are actually in compliance with the court order currently. We are complying with the court order right now as we speak. The department is working. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a lot of uh, work that goes into even um, having a lease sale. And so uh, they are complying with the court order now, today. So the ban has been released? Uh, the the I, I suppose that um, the the pause that you are referring to that President Biden uh, ordered in his executive order is uh, is I suppose it's in effect. I mean, you you can uh, say that as soon as you know the lease one lease sale happens that the the pause is over, uh, but. What I can say is we're complying with the court order, and um, we are doing the the work necessary to move in that direction. So the pause is not in place at this time. Well, t technically, um, I I suppose you you could say the pause is still in place. Um, however, we are complying with the court order to move forward on releasing the report and um, in moving this issue forward. Does the report contain formal binding decisions or anything that will be enforceable? As I mentioned earlier, Senator, the report is in its final, uh, you know, internal, uh, the, the final internal draft, and I am unable to comment on it at the moment. Okay, the and what action has the department taken to be in compliance with the judge's ruling? Have there been any decisions to reinstate leases, lease sales, but specifically I'm referring to lease sale 257? Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I, unfortunately, I can't comment uh, specifically on uh, the question that you're asking. We would be more than happy to be back in touch with you as soon as we do have uh, specific answers to your questions. Um, I know that overall the department is working uh, on uh, uh, ensuring that we are complying with the court order. And with the lease sale 257, are you familiar with that lease sale 257? Uh, Senator, I, I am, uh, I understand uh, the question you're asking and I, I want to assure you that we are doing our best to move forward. Okay, because I see my time is out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Hickenlooper. Oh, Madam Secretary, uh, first, before I do anything, I want to express my appreciation and gratitude for uh, coming out to Colorado during your confirmation. We, if you remember, we encouraged uh, and made that offer and encouraged your early visit to Colorado, uh, and the entire state, I think, appreciates it. Um, we talked about public lands, the CORE Act, uh, wildfires, and I thought again and again we saw genuine bipartisanship, uh, and I know a lot of people in Colorado were impressed that uh, we taught, we had Republicans and Democrats and independents and everyone at those meetings uh, all working for that, that sense of clean air, clean water, and, and public lands. Um, I also got the sense that you saw and, and heard clearly the long-term value that uh, having a Western presence holds for the BLM um, by making sure that the employees are close to the land they manage. Uh, and I think you heard clearly the, the meaning that has, the importance of that to the local community. Um, so I think obviously that presence is, is, is a shared value and is of real importance. I wanted to ask you some of your takeaways from that trip, uh, particularly from our time and, and conversations in Grand Junction. Thank you so much, Senator. And I, again, I appreciate your hospitality. While we were in Colorado, it was a really, really uh, wonderful time. Um, and of course, I was uh, thrilled to have opportunities to have those meetings. We met with the staff. Um, both in person and through uh, and remotely at the BLM headquarters. Uh, we were happy to um, be with you during the public meeting as well. 
Um, I think my takeaways are that, um, that uh, we need to come to a decision fairly soon. It, it is, uh, it's important for folks to be able to know and understand um, uh, what their task at hand is, and the way we do that is just, just to make sure that folks are, you know, can hunker down and, and know what they're doing. So um, we're taking all those. Um, I got more, in fact, I got more um, comments uh, through by staff through email by the time I got home. And so uh, we're looking at all of those and sort of assessing um, all of the comments that we heard and uh, just appreciate that opportunity. Uh, I heard repeatedly the, your willingness to listen. I suspect you probably got more comments than you knew what to do with. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, put in that additional plug that um, when that transfer of the BLM headquarters took place to Colorado, there's a lot of, has been a lot of discussion about how poorly it was done and in many ways uh, certain, of the, certain of the processes which were enacted seem to actually create unhappiness and were designed to get people to leave the BLN, BLM and to uh, make it less functional. And I think that I want to make sure that I reemphasize that that has nothing to do with Grand Junction and the appreciation of that community and the re relationship that community has developed with the BLM over the, the, uh, this past year. And, and what a great sign that is for the relationship of the West with the BLM, where most of the land is. Mm -hmm. uh, let me switch to, um, anyway, I, I don't want to belabor that point. I know you're, <laughs> you're uh, we've, we've, pretty much everywhere we went in Colorado, we talked about the BLM, I think. Anyway, uh, as we discussed also, too many uh, underprivileged communities grow up, grow up without any access to uh, outdoor spaces. Uh, and your support for the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program from your days in the House, um, and more recently as Secretary, has really helped uh, us imagine how to close that nature gap. Uh, but obviously, we still have work ahead of us. Uh, Senator Padilla and I have championed a one-time investment of $500 million uh, in local parks and open space as part of the Parks, Jobs, and Equity Act. Um, and do you, see, do you see this funding for local parks and, and, and connections into uh, disadvantaged communities as a, a worthwhile infrastructure priority? I absolutely believe that every American deserves to be in open space and, and, not it, and, and it not be a chore to get there. Yes. Oh, great. Well, I, 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 we share that, and I think that this is a great opportunity to do that. Uh, I'm pretty much out of time. I do want to say that I heard I heard at least four or five times, and I think I would have heard it a hundred times if I could have had more ears, uh, that people said they would remember uh, the Secretary of the Interior coming to some of these small towns, uh, uh, Palisade, Colorado, and um, uh, uh, Ridgeway, where people said they would remember this moment for the rest of their lives, and it really does speak, reflect very well on you and the Department of the Interior. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, welcome. Good morning. Um, there has been a, a lot of conversation this morning, or certainly a lot of questions with regards to the oil and gas review and the timing on that. Your, your department has consistently said that this is going to be released early summer. Well, we're beyond early summer. Uh, last month, you testified before the House Natural Resources Committee that it will be coming soon. Um, last week, you said you were quoted um, Again, that it will be soon. You have replied to Senator Manchin, Barrasso, Lankford, Smith this morning that it will be soon. So I'm not going to ask you when you think it's going to be coming because I think I know what your answer is. And I still don't, none of us know what your answer is. And so uh, I hope you can sense the frustration that so many of us have in anticipating this and uh, wondering when, when we will be able to expect that you'll be in compliance with the judge's order. What I would like to ask of you, and you can provide me this in writing, is a list of stakeholders and entities that you've met with in Alaska, including state officials, ANCs, tribes, and private companies, as you've been doing this, this outreach for the review. And I, I would appreciate that in a timely manner. I want to switch to a subject that Senator Lankford touched on, and this is the 30 
30 uh, program that has now been rebranded, re America the Beautiful, um, I have shared with you and with others in the department my, my concern and my great frustration with the uh, seven, 17 D1 withdrawals in the state of Alaska. These are the, the millions of, of acres that are in restricted status despite the fact that the report commissioned by Congress specifically said that these, these withdrawals have outlived their, their intended purpose. They need to be lifted now. The concern that I have now is that one of the reasons um, there may be hesitancy on lifting these D1 withdrawals is, is out of a fear that the measurable prog or any measurable progress on, on the 30 by 30 goal could be impacted. You've kind of suggested to, to Senator Lankford in terms of how, I'm, I'm not quite sure how the department is measuring the total numbers of, of lands being conserved under this program. I think we've had, uh, again, asked and, and not really answered on that. But can you tell me whether any of the 17 D1 withdrawals that are are lifted would be counted against the 30 by 30 goal? Senator, I can't, I, I, I can't give you an answer on that. Um, I don't think, I don't, uh, in the conversations that my staff has had uh, with stakeholders regarding 30 by 30, that issue has never come up. Okay, I'll, I'll be pursuing that to try to get a little more definition to that because that's, that's one of the only things that I can think of in terms of why we have been um, uh, why we've been further further delayed on the on the D1 withdrawals. I want to speak uh, to to an issue that I'm sure you can anticipate. Senator Hickenlooper uh, recognize that you have been to to small communities in in Colorado. Know that we are looking forward to your visit. I understand it will probably be in some time in September. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that visit, as you have promised me in the committee, is that you will take that opportunity to visit with the people uh, of King Cove. Your department's been working with the state of Alaska, the Department of Transportation, um, regarding these special use permits to conduct the surveys for the road that we've been talking about. We've had some hiccups, um, but I think initially your staff was really working with mine. They were working with the state of Alaska to ensure that these permits could be issued in time for the summer field season. Um, everything seemed to be going really pretty much on track uh, until the beginning of, the, of, of this month. And now we find out that literally at the 11th hour of these permits being issued, state already has contractors at the site beginning, preparing to begin work. And, and we find out that the department has rescinded the January 15 secretarial memo, memo that was issued by Secretary Bernhardt. This was the basis for these permits being issued. In fairness, the state wasn't alerted that it had been withdrawn. We weren't alerted that it had been withdrawn. We had to find out that it had been requested through, through a, a media source. So now the department is shifting this whole process for these permits by telling the state that Fish and Wildlife now needs to do a refuge compatibility analysis and minimum requirements analysis, which may require public comment and, and review. So we've got a situation here where up until just literally days ago, maybe uh, a week and a half ago, your department was working with the state. They were working with us for six months to shepherd these permits. And not once was there any indication, any indication that these permits would not be issued or that there was a problem for the basis of the permits and that the process was effectively going to need to be changed. We haven't been given any reason why the process would be changed for issuing the permits or why the limited use uh, of helicopter would now be denied even though, even though helicopters have been used for survey work in the refuge previously. So I just have to ask the question, what is going on here? Why was the state not notified that this January 15th memo had been rescinded? And, and really what I need from you is I need a commitment that these permits are going to be issued. They're going to be issued not soon, but they're going to be issued in the next two weeks and that the state be allowed to complete their survey work during this field season as 
everybody had anticipated would be done. Senator, I, I will find out. I don't know why the state wasn't notified at this moment, and, but I will find that out, and uh, I will I, I absolutely, now I, yes, I will need to get to the bottom of that. Um, I will, will, I'll take this issue back. I, I absolutely understand, and, and it, we will make it a priority and, and talk about this as soon as I am back at the department. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I, I'd like to provide you with just a timeline of all of the, of the assurances that we've received in the past six months that everything was on track. I think that that will probably help you and your team. It certainly has led to the confusion and the consternation that has put, it, put us at this place today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Secretary Holland. Great to see you again, and congratulations on your confirmation as Secretary of the Interior. Um, it's timely that you're testifying today on the Department's budget. At the same time, we're working on this uh, infrastructure legislation. Uh, I'd like to compare the administration's budget request to the bipartisan infrastructure bill that's taking shape, and your views here would be appreciated. Uh, I'll start with the drought. Uh, for fiscal year 2022, the administration requests $1.6 billion for the Bureau of Reclamation, the department's primary water agency for Western states. Uh, the American Jobs Plan proposes an additional $2.5 billion for reclamation to cover water efficiency and recycling. It also covers tribal water settlements and dam safety. I personally don't think that's enough. Across the West and in Arizona, especially, we have uh, hundreds of aging reclamation projects, dam and irrig irrigation canals that need repair. These are often leaking and they're inefficient. We also need resources to protect uh, aquatic species impacted by the reclamation projects, including fish and wildlife on the Colorado River. The bipartisan bill reported by this committee earlier this month provides about $8.3 billion for reclamation. This includes funding the water recycling, ecosystem restoration, tribal projects, and also reclamation's aging infrastructure account that, by the way, has never been funded before. Another infrastructure priority in, in our rural communities um, I mean, they're threatened by wildfire. Uh, the committee's bill proposes over $1.1 billion to the Department of Interior for wildfire and fuels management, uh, for burned area recovery, and for federal firefighter pay. By com comparison, DOI received $220 million for wildfire fuels management last year. And according to the administration's budget, that amount would treat burnable vegetation across 1.7 million acres of federal and tribal lands. So, um, Secretary Holland, would you agree that a lot of good work in drought and wildfire resiliency can be accomplished under the bipartisan infrastructure proposal? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Um, we are hoping uh, and working uh, today still to, to try to, to get this done. Thank you. Very important for our country. It's certainly important for the West, uh, especially for the state of Arizona. Um, the bipartisan bill would also authorize $3 billion to fund cleanup of abandoned hard rock mines on federal, state, and tribal lands through an amendment co-sponsored by Senator Heinrich, Senator Daines, and myself. Uh, Arizona has roughly 24,000 abandoned mines that we know of. Some 500 of these are Cold War era uranium mines on the Navajo Nation. Um, so we need to fund the Hard Rock Mine Cleanup Program. Can we count on your support for these efforts? We absolutely support cleaning up abandoned mines. Yes, it's. Yes, absolutely. 
Yeah, the, the 500 uranium mines on the Navajo Nation has been, a, um, I, I think, a, a historic failure of, of government to not address this adequately. Um, it is affecting the health of uh, so many of the Navajo people, and, and it needs, needs to be addressed. So uh, Senator Daines and Heinrich and I um, have put forth this legislation uh, that would authorize the funds to clean up these hard rock mines. So thank you for your support. I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you, Senator. Now we have Senator Daines. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, um, thank you, Secretary Holland, for being here today. Um, I want to talk about one of my favorite subjects is the grizzly bear. The uh, successful recovery of the grizzly bear in the greater Yellowstone and North Continental Divide epitomizes what the authors of the Endangered Species Act first envisioned. What they didn't envision, however, was for these listing decisions to become hyper-politicized and to bounce around in the courts. Here's the facts. In the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, in 1975, and these are Fish Wildlife Service's numbers, there were 136 grizzly bears, according to their numbers. The criteria for recovery was 390. They raised that to 500 back in 2006. And today, the FWS number is 728, uh, nearly 50% above already raised recovery target. In the North, Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, that's up along the Rocky Mountain front in kind of central Montana, the criteria was 391 bears. Today there's 1,068. It's been over 16 years since the greater Yellowstone grizzly bear was determined to be recovered, 16 years. And while these two recovered populations languish on the endangered species list, conflicts with grizzlies are on the rise. In Montana, we have tragically already had two grizzly human fatalities uh, this year. Uh, there was a bicyclist who was bicycling across our state. She had a tent pitched in Ovando, Montana, mm -hmm. back behind the museum there. It's a small town. And the grizzly bear came into town and ripped her out of the tent and brutally killed her. Now, Montana has a proven track record of conserving recovered predators and is more than ready to assume responsibility of managing the grizzly bear. For the sake of our communities, for our ranchers, for other wildlife, and the bear itself, it's time to restore management back to the state. Uh, Secretary Holland, a simple yes or no question. Do you agree with the wildlife biologists from your own agency that the bear has recovered in these two ecosystems? Senator, if, if you'll permit me to just say I'm sorry for the loss of, of the, your constituents. It's a very sad story. Um, I, I could, yes, the, uh, the ongoing recovery is a remarkable excess for the act. Okay, so you'd, you'd acknowledge that uh, the bear has recovered, exceeded the recovery targets in these two ecosystems. It sounds like the, the Endangered Species Act is, has done what it was meant to do. I, I think that's, that's, that's exactly right. We would heartily agree with that. That, uh, that the, the numbers, it's, it's, it's not that complicated. There's targets, and then you take the FWS numbers, which I think many believe are on the conservative side, but they're still way above the recovery targets that were even raised once before, certainly in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So thank you that you agree with these. They have recovered these two ecosystems. Um, do you agree with that statement? And if so, would you support my legislation to codify the Fish and Wildlife Service's 2017 rule delisting the grizzly bear in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Senator, we're more than happy to, to speak with you, to work with you, to, to, you know, to make sure that we're listening. We, we'll, we'll, we're always happy to work with Congress, and, and this issue is no different. I appreciate it. I think the frustration for so many Montanans is that uh, you have individuals who are a long ways away here in D.C. 
who uh, might not always be able to find Montana on a map, who are dictating uh, policies that uh, are affecting Montanans greatly when they look at the quantitative data that suggests it's very clear and compelling that the, the bear has recovered. We should celebrate that, that the bear has recovered and, and transfer the uh, management of the species back to the state. I want to talk about 3030 for a moment. It's been six months since the Biden administration first announced the 30 by 30 initiative, and yet few, if any, details of the plan have come out. Uh, the administration said it's going to be locally led. It's going to incorporate working lands. But anybody with a public lands background knows that there are multiple environmental and land planning laws already in place to ensure this is already the case. Secretary Holland, I asked you a similar question during your confirmation hearing, but um, I'd like to try to see if we can get a clearer answer. Given the many planning and environmental laws guiding actions on federal land, it's NEPA, uh, Federal Land Policy Management Act, ESA, in what meaningful way are locally led collaboration not already guiding public land conservation? Well, I believe very strongly that a lot of locally led folks are, are participating in conversations about our public lands. And, um, and that's why we've been careful to ensure that we are bringing those folks to the table for this issue as well. Right. Mr. Chairman, I'm into extra innings here. Uh, thank you for your grace, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Holland. Welcome back to the committee, and congratulations to you on your successful nomination. We know we're going to have a lot of fun working together and just look, look forward. We'd agree on so many goals uh, together. Yeah, probably two hot spots back home are the size of the federal budget in 3030. Your budget is uh, asked for an increase of 17%. That's $2.5 billion. Do you see, is, is there plans in your budget to take some of that monies to implement 3030? And what does that look like to you all? I appreciate the question, Senator, and thank you also for the card that you sent over to my office. I appreciated that very much. Um, with respect to 30 by 30, of course, we we have felt that it's you know it's a it's a collaborative uh, initiative. We hope that uh, many people, uh, private landowners or you know organizations, farmers, ranchers, will all participate in that. Um, and we have done much to ensure those conversations move forward. Um, with respect to details on that, um, I would love to ask for Rachel's help, and um, she can perhaps provide more details. Hi, Senator. Thanks so much for the question. I mean, I, we, we have spoken this morning already about how the, the initiative itself is in development, including what methods are going to be used to measure success and sort of what the shape will be going forward. I think to the point about the, the locally led conservation, um, you know, there's, there's two pieces to it. One is that, um, you know, we do want to have a better, better data collection across landscape levels to see how lands are being managed and conserved. Um, and so there are some resources within the UN, U.S. Geological Survey budget that, that support, you know, ongoing efforts to, to, to support databases to look at land cover. Um, the other issue is the partnership programs that are so strong in the department. I mean, 30 by 30 amplifies longstanding programs, state and tribal wildlife grant programs, joint venture programs, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And this is how we're reaching in to some of the, the partner uh, programs on the ground. So my, so my question was, do you think that you'll be using that extra $2.5 billion to purchase lands? So the land, uh, the land acquisition budget right now is, is funded through the, the Great American Outdoors Act, which fully funded through uh, through that. So that's, that is our acquisition budget, which is done okay. through the mandatory. When, when it comes to CRP and other conservation programs, within your concepts of 30 by 30, will this all be voluntary or will we have, will we folks be forced to participate? It's intended to be voluntary uh, and locally led and to, to pull in programs. You mentioned the USDA program and we're looking across landscapes and at different federal partners as well. Okay. Um, Secretary, I'd like to go back to the Endangered Species Act and uh, forgive me if you've answered this already, but how do, you, how do you measure success? How do you see success 
You know, the grizzly bear is one example. The lesser prairie chicken is another example where, where when there's been private government partnerships, we've seen some success. And of course, Mother Nature and Rain helps a little bit as, as well. We know very well how to get on that list. How do we figure out how to get off the, off the list? Senator, I know that the Endangered Species Act is guided by, um, to a large degree, by science, and, um, and of course, the data and the science are certainly important in making any of those determinations. Um, I, I also, I mean, we, we have to add in another factor for so much of what we do, and that is climate change. Um, we've, we have seen how devastating climate change has been to the West uh, with respect to the drought that we're, the severe, extreme, there's, I don't know how many adju more adjectives we can find to describe the type of drought that we're experiencing in the West right now. And so all of those factors, um, you know, part of it, of course, is making sure that they have the habitat that they need. And, and in some places, yes, species are doing better than they are in other places. So taken as a whole, that's the job for the scientists, and we listen carefully. Okay, forgive me, last question. Let's go back to CRP. Are you aware of the upstream and downstream economic consequences if we would take a third of the farmland in Kansas or pasture land and put it into conservation um, that we would end up just needing to close high schools and at least every third hospital? Thank you. Thank you for that information, Senator. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Madam Secretary, thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. um, you just mentioned in your last response to Senator Marshall that um, your analysis will factor in the climate change issue. Uh, we've seen as this pause has continued that the president is now basically begging OPEC to increase production because he wishes to hold down gasoline prices. And yet we know from an Obama-era study that, gasoline, that oil produced in the outer continental shelf of the United States is the most environmentally, if you will, lowest carbon footprint per unit of production of any oil that comes to our shores. Now, does your analysis include that, that since clearly the administration is begging for oil to be produced elsewhere in the, in the world, that if it's produced in the OCS, that it actually has a lower carbon footprint per unit of production of any oil that comes to our shores? Is, does your analysis include that? Um, Senator, I know that we have a terrific team at the Department of the Interior, and I am positive that they're factoring in uh, everything they need to and any decisions that they make. Now, you're being far less specific than you were just with Senator Marshall, which always raises my kind of spidey web senses a little bit, uh, because it seems as if the answer to Marshall was, boy, we're looking at climate change as a factor in these forest fires. But then when I ask if the specific analysis shows data, previously developed by the Obama administration, the answer is more vague. Um, can I ask you to make sure that the scientists doing this analysis both take into consideration this previous Obama-era finding, they make explicit that it's used, and if it turns out that the decision to continue the pause, which, by the way, seems to be illegal, uh, is made, that this is explained why it is being extended in the light of this uh, fact, which I just suggested. Uh, th thank you, Senator. I, I will make sure that I take this back to the department. Thank you. Now, we know that the pause is effectively defying the federal judge's order to continue, but nonetheless, we have a new five-year leasing plan that will soon be required. Can you tell us uh, what is the current status of developing the new five-year program? And does the department think it will have a final pro new leasing program uh, by, the, by the end of next June? Um, I was aware that the five-year plan um, from 2017 to 2022 is coming to an end point, And um, we don't yet have a specific timeline to release a proposed plan, but they are complying with the court decision. They're working on that as well. Of course, I'm not speaking when the court decision, as my understanding, pertains to the current plan. I'm speaking of the next five-year plan. 
Yes, they are working on that next five-year plan. And have you started the programmatic environmental impact statement? Uh, Senator, I'd be happy to um, go back this afternoon, have a conversation with the um, principal deputy assistant secretary and make sure that you get an answer to your question. Thank you. Again, you brought up um, uh, you brought up the issue of climate change and how you're factoring all that in. Um, uh, during a recent uh, hearing of the BOEM director, Ms. Amanda Lefton, suggested that if we, you know, uh, my words, not hers, but that if you leave it in the ground, you're going to decrease demand. That seems, again, a little bit. Now the administration is begging OPEC to increase production, improving OPEC nations' economies, while at the same time they're pausing development in our lands. There's a heck of a lot in there that the American workers should be angry about. But what are your thoughts on the need to influence demand um, in order to reduce climate change risk? Should we leave it in the ground? Senator, uh, as I've said in my confirmation hearing and many times since, the gas and oil in industry will um, will go on for years to come. Uh, I don't see an, an, an I, I get that, but that's not my point, that. really. The question is, because clearly um, uh, Valero can import oil from Venezuela or from OPEC. Um, Venezuela is part of OPEC, but from the Middle East, uh, as opposed to bringing it on shore from the Gulf of Mexico. So they'll be in business. The question is, are we going to produce the oil with our environmental standards, which are the best in the world, are we going to produce it with those of nations which take less care for emissions and which currently the administration is begging for them to increase production? So, again, just to put a point on it, does it decrease demand if we do not produce U.S. oil? Uh, I, I, can't, uh, I, I wish I were an economist and could answer you in all uh,